Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to address a question primarily to Mr. Smith and Mr. Hale, but would welcome the comments from, from any members of the, the panel. Uh, as you know, the FAA uh, is currently under a moratorium on issuing regulations regarding certain aspects of commercial space, fl sp space flight. And uh, what I would like to ask you is if you can elaborate on, on your views as to the importance of that moratorium and whether it should be extended and in what regards. Mm -hmm. Since I was at the FAA when the 2004 Act was first passed, and um, we had a very, very clear sense then, and I think now, that even while the moratorium was in place, if we had an unfortunate circumstance, if we observed something that was not safe, then we would be obligated to step up our oversight, to begin regulating, to recommend to Congress that we take a different approach if that were to happen. In the interim, I think the reason for the moratorium was to allow the, the time for vehicle developers to test and develop, to continue to collect data, to try things, to see it, if they work, all operating under the broad rubric of safety, which is the mantra in the commercial space launch industry. I think that uh, things have not materialized as quickly as perhaps Congress contemplated at the time, and we have yet to have those first flights operational flights taking people to and from suborbital space that would allow the collection of data. However, every one of the vehicle developers that are in this market are testing, collecting data all the time, testing and developing, and they continue to maintain a position that says that they will fly when they are ready to fly, not before. So I think to the extent that the, the, the moratorium would be extended, I would say eight years beyond the first operational flight with humans on it. Senator Cruz, I, I would, I'm mindful of the fact that the FAA does, in fact, provide regulations for suborbital flight today, but they're regulations to protect the public. Uh, so the FAA has, uh, has an extensive licensing proce uh, process to ensure that these suborbital operators are protecting uh, the, the non-involved public and property, um, and, uh, and that is a very important aspect of their work. The other aspect of this is that everyone recognizes that in these early days, this is a, an experimental, high-risk um, situation, and the, the space flight participants, the space tourists, if you will, that are going to participate in this um, need to be fully informed of the risks that are involved when they take on this high-risk endeavor. People uh, in America today can take on many high-risk endeavors, um, backcountry skiing, you know, scuba diving in certain places. There are all kinds of high-risk endeavors that the federal government does not regulate, but to which we try to make sure the participants are fully informed of the hazards. And that, I think, is the basis for the current moratorium that that these participants coming from fields uh, not first in the, the necessarily aerospace can be informed of what it is they're really signing up for and have informed consent. That's a very important part of this uh, so-called moratorium. Um, and the other part of it, I think, also is that the Federal Aviation Administration is struggling with exactly how to write regulations for this new industry and that some experience in watching how the industry performs uh, would be very helpful to the FAA as they consider what regulations might be required. To go out and write regulations in advance of operations, uh, I think, would be uh, a very onerous thing to the industry and probably not efficient from the government standpoint. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to ask a question of Captain Lopez Alegria, which is many of the concerns we hear about commercial space have to do with the prospects of actual markets uh, that will be able to sustain these efforts over and above the provision of services to the government. And can you 
share your views regarding the potential markets outside of the U.S. government? Yes. Um, may I just add on to what uh, the a a absolutely, Mr. please. So, I, first of all, I, I would agree with uh, both Wayne and Patty about what they said. First of all, the FAA is certainly um, regulating third-party safety right now, and also the reason that uh, it was this learning period was put into place was to allow industry to innovate, so we wouldn't stifle things to um, cut off solutions to technical problems before their time. Um, but just from a philosophical standpoint. Um, while I think eight years is a good number, um, which is a number that they picked in 2004, um, I, I, I wonder whether this industry um, needs, to be, needs to have that learning period removed uh, ever. And I know that sounds a little drastic, but let me just walk you through that. So, you know, uh, as Wayne mentioned, scuba diving, bungee jumping, there are a lot of things that people do that most others would consider high risk. And, um, I would be happy to see regulation in the commercial spaceflight industry when the commercial spaceflight industry looks like the commercial aviation industry. When it's that routine, when you can get on an airplane just like it's a taxi or any other mode of transportation, I think r regulation is appropriate then. Um, I, that to me seems like a long way off, and so I would just put out there as a stake in the ground that um, th this is something that as, as long as people can operate under informed consent and be well informed of those risks, that we ought to let that work in, in that sort of more free and enterprising environment. So on the question of, of orbital markets. Um, and, and can you elaborate uh, for, for a bit more on the deleterious impact that, that, that you think it would, would have if the moratorium were to expire on, on a sooner time frame? Uh, I, I think there are two things. First, while the industry is still in development, the, the, the degree to which companies can choose to use a hybrid rocket motor or a liquid rocket motor or some other kind of rocket motor, they ought to be able to choose that and not have the FAA or anybody else say, you need to use a liquid rocket motor because that's what NASA has been using on their vehicles or something <coughs> like that. So one is the... Um, reduce the reduction of the uh, set of options available to solve technical problems. And the second is that um, when um, in the absence of regulation, people can um, exercise their own judgment to use, to, to inform themselves of what the risks are. And I, I do want to mention that um, Mr. Hale is chairing uh, our committee within the commercial spaceflight industry of uh, developing standards, and one of the standards is to define exactly what that piece of paper should say that the customer spaceflight participant would have to read before he gets on um, the rocket and signs his informed consent. But to the extent that we have um, industries that are that that make that have commerce based on people that are willing to do those things uh, as long as they're informed and that the government protect people who are not second parties to that, then I think it's, um, it is more in keeping with our sort of philosophy of free and open markets. Okay, and, and if, if you had some comments on, on the additional right. so back to the orbit. I wish I could point to a study like the Tory Group study on the suborbital side, and I can't. Um, I will just make the following observation. Uh, I, I flew in 2006 with a uh, so-called spaceflight participant, a tourist that went up to the ISS on a Soyuz seat, um, and I flew home in 2007 with another one that had flown up in the meantime. And every single excess Soyuz seat has been sold with, uh, you know, unsatisfied demand. So clearly there is a market out there. Now, are there as many people that can pay that kind of price as there can that, that can pay uh, the suborbital price? Clearly not. But the idea is that once you start filling excess capacity with um, non-government, uh, or at least non-U.S. government, so they could be sovereign um, government clients, or they could be private uh, research firms, or they could be universities, or they could be just private citizens that could either take 
three of the seven seats that are on all of these commercial crew vehicles to the ISS, use the national lab facilities that are up there that are dedicated to private and uh, academic research to come up with some aha moment, <coughs> decide, hey, I would like to be able to do this on a bigger scale, go contract with Bigelow, get an inflatable habitat, have your own transportation. That is how the market is going to start. I just can't say when. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, that was my